Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. My business is challenging, so I've got to find the work. What my physical life helps me with is having confidence that I can cope because I'm always signing up for the next thing. So this weekend, I'm racing at High Rocks. My partner in it is a better runner than me, so I'm under pressure already because I'm going to try and run with someone who is better than I am, which ups my game, puts me under pressure. It's been hard, right? But actually, signing up gives me that goal, keeps me striving makes me better. There's going to be boring and difficult days for all of us, whether we're signing up for physical challenges or not. It helps me get through them because there's always been a higher purpose. Like with the the Strive Challenge, I would never have run to Dover, rode the channel, cycled to Verbier, walked to Zermatt and climbed the Matterhorn if I hadn't been part of a team where the purpose was bigger than me. And that wonderful feeling of being part of something. My inner critic since I was a kid was never good enough, never good enough, not good enough, not good enough. So it's always like, get better. Today I'm talking to Lara Millwood, a neuroleadership coach and athlete who has co-founded businesses in leadership and fitness. She's worked in gender equality with Shine for Women and is a mentor for Resurgo. The official coach of Virgin's Strive Challenge, Lara practices what she preaches, moving every day to challenge both mental and physical muscle and believes we all need to treat our mental muscle just like our physical muscle, giving it a challenge, fuel, rest and recovery. In our conversation, Lara shares the power of a starting gun, what happened when she tried her first mountain climb up the Matterhorn, and what she learned about herself from witnessing her child in intensive care. Lara, thank you so much for joining me on Better Under Pressure. I'm very, very excited about having a conversation with you as an endurance sportswoman, as a, a powerful woman in her own right, mother of people that are also performers. It should be an exciting exploration around pressure. So thank you. Oh, thank you too, Sarah. Delighted to be here today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Good. So what does pressure mean to you now, Lara? Oh, what a great question. What does pressure mean to me now? I was thinking about this, Sarah. It's challenge for me. It makes me a better person. I actually seek it and love it and need it. I was reflecting on this and I have always been a challenge seeker and I know I do my best work under pressure. Always have done. I was thinking back to when I did my motorbike test And I dropped the bike and I dropped the motorbike and everyone was looking at me thinking, oh my God, who is this woman? The gun went, test time, perfect, nailed it. I've also been practicing with the talks that I do, keeping my mental muscle challenged and stronger. I said, Laura, don't use the notes, don't use your slides. You know enough, believe. Yeah. Even if I don't get it all in and I put my notes down, I put myself under that pressure And something happens, Sarah, I have a moment before the talk when I think, oh, my God, I don't know anything. Oh, my God. And then gun goes, boom, and something clicks in the brain. And I find that sort of resonant frequency, my my husband calls it. But it's a bit like flow state, I suppose. But I do respond well to pressure and I seek it. Yeah. Oh, well, there's so many things in there. But um, one of the things that's really striking me as you're talking is like in all of those examples you've just shared, the gun goes. Well, obviously the gun doesn't go on a presentation of when you're talking, <laughs> does it? But there must be something because of your sport background, I suppose, and your training where that that sort of mental switch of the gun going yeah. seems to be very powerful for you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm actually surprised I even said that word because I don't normally talk about guns and it's probably not very appropriate. So I do apologize. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking of the start gun. So I yeah. What a question, Sarah. You've just totally given me an aha moment. Um, I, which is what the power of coaching and questions. <laughs> swimming. I swam competitively from the age of six to 38. And so the start gun 
and that moment on the blocks where you have to have control of your amygdala, you have to control, have control of your fight flight, your body starts to shake, your mind goes into overload, but you know you have to take that breath, hold on, deal with that limbic amygdala flood into the prefrontal cortex because you have to perform. Yes. You've just made me realize that that's probably why I say that. It's deeply seated in me. I'm sure it is. And and that's what I love about these conversations is that sometimes the stuff that you are doing unconsciously as an adult um, has actually been quite a purposeful and deliberate repetition from quite a young age, positive and negative sometimes, hey. But it's it feels like if you've been swimming since six and that starting gun has been a very powerful moment for you to go, right, you're on. I was talking to somebody yeah. a couple of months ago and she was saying, she, she says it's showtime, right? It's like, so she says that to herself, it's showtime, whether she's in a, an organization or, or whether she's presenting or whatever. And I think it's a similar thing. We've all got those moments where we just think, right, enough now, you're on. Absolutely. And what I think it's given me is that ability to deal with pressure and challenge in other areas of your life because you ha- you learn over time that self-belief that you can deal with it, but you learn to deal with that flood of emotional response and to still cope. And I think that's why I think it's been my life work, Sarah, to share that with others, that if you can get through things that are physically challenging, whatever Mm -hmm. that means to you, whether it's walking up a hill or taking on yoga or mouth and foot painting that I've done with some people, your self-belief and confidence grows to deal with times when it's difficult, when it's pressured. Yeah. You know, when you were... Um, training to swim. Was that the first thing you did at six where you were given that sort of deliberate approach to performing? Yes. I was also the child that ran for the stage. So I was doing public speaking and Bible reading and ballet and things like that. But I don't remember the pressure being as much or as timely. Right. So yes, I'd say swimming was probably the... When you say timely, is that because you've got people on that you're obviously competing against yes and so therefore the gun is like a a trigger for everybody yes and you get a score yes of course time which is very very exposing and i suppose we would you know the, the person doing public speaking or bible reading or whatever it was would get first second or third prize but it felt less it felt less pressured i'm not sure i know why actually yeah, and I'm wondering if which one helped the other. I'm really curious, um, you know, when we're working with adults around this sort of transference of skills, that sometimes environments limit your capacity to, to access the many various different ways of mm. performing or managing ourselves under pressure. We, we compartmentalize them unconsciously sometimes, I think. So I'm curious to know whether the, the sort of the stage performance that you were doing at a young age and the sports performance mutually like borrowed things, whether you were conscious of it doing that or whether, you know, what came first, I suppose. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think we do try and put things in buckets a bit like we do with, I wanna make a bicep stronger or I wanna fat reduce here or something's going on with my tummy and I'm not thinking about the stress in my mind. So we are all one unit and it all works together. So yes. in a sense, I think you're absolutely right. I think the fact that I was, challenging myself and challenged in both areas, whether that was speaking, swimming, dancing, um, made me stronger as a child, made me stronger. And it was all good practice, I guess. And there's all learning in that, which is now applicable as an adult and which I think helps as a coach, helping others to get through. Yeah. And do you think there's this, I was talking to somebody once and they were saying, you know, that they're, they watch this relationship, this dynamic between pressure and improvement and upping the pressure in order to persuade, particularly a younger person, that they can manage it. And when it tips the balance to when the pressure's, t- the, 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 um, the expectation is so much that the pressure becomes depleting to the young person so that the confidence suffers. It sounds to me from the way you're talking that the, the coaches, the people that were working with you as a young person, um, managed that very well for you. Mm. Do you think that that is the way they did it? There was something about how they incrementally helped you build your confidence 
mm. in swimming or in dancing or in performing generally. And do you th have you seen the reverse happen when the pressure from a coach, particularly in the sporting environment where it's become too much and so therefore the pressure has become depleting? I'm just very curious about that dynamic. I think my honest answer as a young person is I don't remember an influence like that, a coach or anyone helping or hindering. I remember the foundation stone I think my parents gave me. And I spoke to my now 92-year-old father, who is a, a pediatrician. My mum was a physiotherapist. And both of them loved children, but they knew that confidence was something that they wanted to give me. And my dad said that specifically. We wanted to make sure that you felt confident to do and try anything. And I think that blanket of security was just the most wonderful thing. The other thing I think that happened, Sarah, I, I was reflecting on growing up in Canada. I don't remember ever feeling conscious of my gender. Mm. So the boys and girls arm wrestled together. We skied together. We swam together. I mean, school was a joy. It was a charmed childhood, I have to say, up until 12. It was a lot of play. A lot of fun, not so much exam stress, no 11 plus, no stratifications in the classroom, no streaming. Um, and that was very freeing. Yeah. I wasn't conscious that a girl couldn't do anything or had the words weaker or smaller or not. Yes. It was yes. always and. And what always, a gift. yes, you can. I do think it was an absolute gift. And there was a very liberal freedom as a child. And it was a lot of fun. And I think because it was fun, I didn't see challenge or pressure as scary. I wasn't anything to fear. That's that marvelous, fear. isn't it? That is a real gift, actually, isn't it? Because I, I, I mean, I remember just as a teacher that whole idea of learning has mm -hmm. to be coupled with fun or enjoyment of some sort. Because the minute the fear hits, it becomes very constricting as opposed to expanding. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually wanted to share with you your lovely animations, you know, you, your wonderful work with Shed. You have to look after your Shed first. And I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, but understanding your reptile, dog and human brain. And in fact, my nephew at the moment with the 11 plus is freezing. He's bright. Mm -hmm. We know he's bright. He finds it really hard to put it on paper and he mm -hmm. finds his brain is freezing. So I actually showed him your animations to show That's him cute. why your dog brain is cowering and how you can override it and boss his brain amazing so and then my sister who's been a head teacher i know you were a teacher as well sarah said oh yeah. my goodness wouldn't have this had been wonderful to have as a teacher yeah. to help children understand their brain a bit like we can only be a better athlete if we understand our body yes understand our brain i understand why i feel like this therefore then i can cope with it yes and i can manage it i think you know that whole the reason we use the word boss is because we can yes. if we choose to Absolutely. Um, and that's the wonderful thing. You know, I know you talked about pressure hindering and I know people choke under pressure and I think it, get, it can get associated with negative. Yeah. But I do really believe that majority of us and I know pressure can become into trauma and other difficult things. And I respect that. But daily occurrences, our brain is immensely powerful. I agree. And with practice, you can do it. I've yeah. seen so many people cope that believe they couldn't. And I think the key, the key thing in that sentence for me is the practice. I agree with you. You know, this is partly why I wanted to put this podcast together is to, to talk about the potential enlivening aspect of pressure and the growing yes. aspect of pressure and the stretching and wonderful, like, oh my God, I can do something that I never thought I could do aspect of pressure. Yes. Um, and yet often I think it does take work, right? Like, I mean, I think we learn a lot of it and a lot of the conversations that I've had here have been with people who've either had a background in sport or they've had a background in repetition of something. So even with, you know, with Marsha last, last week when I was talking to her as, as an actress, you know, this, there's, she kept talking about the importance of preparation, this stuff yeah. of repeating and uh, repeating and knowing your drill and knowing what you can do to enable you to perform at your best. And I think sometimes the speed of, of which most people are operating in right now um, really dilutes that. Yes. Yes, I, I agree with you um, in the sense that. So we go from our soft shoes to sitting in cars, to sitting in offices, to looking at screens. So what we've done is a lot of sitting in boxes and looking yes. at boxes. And we're designed to move. We're beautifully, we're a yeah. wonder of magical science that is designed to move. We know we are cognitive endurance athletes designed to move yes. in things. 
same time. When you remove all movement from life, we're not getting rid of any of that cortisol. You're not burning it off. You're not, you're not yeah. removing yourself from the beta and gamma wave of being on task at work into an alpha state when you can walk and think and process, but also calm the amygdala. Yeah. So there's, there's so much in our current world that is increasing anxiety and pressure. And, um, and I will repeat and repeat, and I'm sure everyone that knows me is bored silly of it. <laughs> Movement and physical challenge, exercise is the best medicine. It absolutely is 100% in every case. And I sort of stand by that thesis. So agree. And and it, that's that requires us to be really deliberate about moving, yes. about our movement. Yes. Um, and not get bossed by this back-to-back, -back, you know, what I feel about back-to-back -back tyranny. Um, of meetings that are normally on the whole sitting down, that are normally looking at screens and all of the things that happen as a result of that. Um Absolutely. So if we, if I, I mean, you're an endurance uh, sportswoman, right? You still are, which is I'm in awe of in terms of the work that you're doing and the the, the things that you do at the weekend <laughs> um, are, are pretty extraordinary. What do you think is your preparation process for that, Laura? I mean, I we've heard just in what you just described so far the power of, and then the gun's gone. You know, the starting gun's gone. I'm on. But what what? Run us through some of the ingredients that you practiced over the years that enable you to take on things that actually other people might look at and think, what? In all honesty, as a young woman, I didn't do a lot of preparation other than the, so what will I say? Yes, I did in the sense that I was signed up to something. So for me, the mm. way to prepare was to be part of a community or part of a shared team. And in there, I found my motivation and my practice. As, okay. a, lo as a loner, I wouldn't have done it. Right. As a businesswoman in my older years, I've been much more on my own. So I have had to instill that discipline of practice and preparation because I got quite used to being brought along with others and had the inspiration of others and then waiting for that pressure point. And I love the pressure point. So for me, it's really hard, the preparation bit. Okay. The limelight on the race and the star golden bit at the end of the rainbow was always the fun bit. I find the preparation, the discipline and the longevity before that quite hard. Yeah. And I do have to continually use my self-talk, use others, as I've said, sign up to things, be part of a community to help that process. Because it's the, you know, the, the iceberg, you know, everyone sees the, the top of the iceberg yeah. and not the work, all the work below. The work below is the hard graft. And I yeah, think but I mean, I really love that honesty about the fact that, you know, for someone who does the extraordinary things that you do in your endurance um, activities and races and competitions, You've been honest about the fact that even though you've done that for so long, it's still like hard work to make yourself do the preparation and that you've you've got some certain ingredients like the power of a group, the yep. first step, sign up, commit. Yes. Um, you know, all of those things that you've mentioned in there are part of your preparation process, clearly. Yes, absolutely. The sign up bit and the other people and the graph. So what I do, I was reflecting on what I do at the moment is obviously my business is challenging. So I've got to find the work, make sure yeah. I'm on top of current methods, the neuroscience, all, all those things. So there's that pressure. What, the, what my physical life helps me with is having confidence that I can cope because I'm always signing up for the next thing. So this weekend I'm mm -hmm. racing at High Rocks. The, my partner in it is a is a better runner than me. It's a run dominated race, so I'm under pressure already because I'm going to try and run with someone who is better than I am, which ups my game, puts me under pressure. But also, Sarah, it's it's been it's been hard, right? Because the internal saboteurs get in the way. Oh God, why have you done this? Oh my God, this is hard. I don't want to run today. I'm not as good as her. And you've yeah. got this constant internal dialogue. But actually, I've found. Signing up gives me that goal, helps me get through the boring stuff, keeps yeah. me learning, keeps me striving, makes me better and gets me through the days. There's going to be boring and difficult days for all of us, whether we're signing up for physical challenges or not. Yeah. But it helps me get through them because there's always been a higher purpose. A bit like with the, with the Strive Challenge, I would never have run to Dover, rode the channel, cycled to Verbier, walked to Zermatt and climb the Matterhorn if I hadn't been part of a team where the purpose was bigger than me, you know, and, and that wonderful feeling of being part of something that's yeah. impactful for so many is, is, is the, is that higher 
lifting your eyes, really, lifting your impact, I suppose, lifting the, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm saying here. Well, I think I'm hearing the fact that when you've got a, a bigger purpose, it sort of makes it really worth it because yes. then yeah. you, then you're contributing to something. You're, the effort yes. is contributing to something that's bigger than you. Yes. Does that play a strong part in what you sign up for? Uh, good question. Yes. A lot of things have always had a philanthropic ending or, or purpose rather, or a, yes. a reason for it. that has become probably more selfish, if you want to call it that, as I've got older, because I know now in my fifties that it's a massive investment in my performance and well-being as I age. So I know that being stronger, being more resilient and always wanting to get better. I think there's a drive in me. My, 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 inter- my inner critic since I was a kid was never good enough, never good enough, not good enough, not good enough is the, is the loop and the strongest voice. So it's always like, get better. Yeah. That's interesting, that connection you've just done with the not good enough, because I think there are so many people, you know, sadly, often women, not only women, but often women in corporations that, that you know, we work in that has this old drumbeat of not mm. enough, not enough, not enough. And so what you're saying there is for you, what was helpful is to say, well, then get better, get better. Yes. Now, somebody else might say, I am enough, I am enough, you know, and actually the work is around welcoming who you are, the whole of you, as you are. Mm. So it's just interesting, little um, different motivator for you, which is keep, keep, keep getting better. And, yeah. it does, and it doesn't feel like it's a slog or or it feels like it's incredibly energizing and enlivening for you. Absolutely. And it's that key word, which is part of your podcast as well, which I love, is better is such a more motivating word than perfect or right yes. and wrong. Yes. It's just better. You know, yes. I work on um, my friend, Adia Depatan, who presents on the television and is a wheelchair basketball athlete and Paralympian. And, you know, we've talked about this a lot. And he said every day I'd get up, go to the basketball hoop, And if I'd done 40 shots the day before, it was 41 the next day. Just one shot better every day. One shot better. Yeah. And that's an analogy that really resonates with me. That little bit every day. I love that. One shot better Mm. every day. Yeah. I mean, just listening to you and hearing you, you just think, and it makes me smile, that phrase. (laughs) You know, like, yeah, what a great thing. Get up in the morning and just think one shot better. And it's a tiny thing. I think that's the thing. Like one, one extra net. Yes. doesn't feel impossible. Exactly. One extra step. One extra, It's all yeah. coping. One extra thing. What's one thing you can do today? I mean, Michael Mosley's doing it beautifully on Radio 4 at the minute. What's one thing you can do to improve your health? What's one thing you can get better at? X. And yeah. what we try and do, especially as women, is be the goddess of everything. You, you can't. And it's overwhelming. And there, we are bombarded by opportunity and choice all the time. So it's a bit like picking a few things you might want to do in the next year or so and just chipping away at it. And yeah. that's what I love about exercise as well. So at CrossFit, we do a thing called a WOD, which is a workout of a day. And sometimes when you look at what you have to achieve in a time Everybody gets nervous. Everyone in the class, I can see it, including myself. Heart rate goes up. You start to worry about the time you're going to get. Yeah. When you get going and you literally just chip away at it, do one squat, then do another squat, then do the push up, and then gradually everyone gets through it. Yeah. And they go, oh my God, I did it. Yeah, yeah. And this is the whole point, as I've gone on about, is that physical challenge at every step, you know, there's all those lovely diagrams we see on social media. There's the summit. If you keep looking at the summit, it looks way too big. Take the first step. Take the first yeah. step. Yeah, it's funny. I was listening to um somebody who had, she was a CEO and she had uh, trekked up to Kilimanjaro with a group of people um, to raise uh, money for the Prince's Trust. Mm-hmm. And she'd never done anything like that before. And she was speaking about it. And it's been so transformational for her on so many levels. But a lot of it is to do with, you know, that slowing down, to go faster that that yes. idea of what you have to and and to go at the pace of the person that's needing that pace but also how much she learned about herself and what was interesting about what she was saying is how she she now can't forget that so like all of that stuff that she's experienced deeply in her in, in her cells the preparation the climb the um the feeling after the climb the descent uh the camaraderie the sort of real sense of having each other's back has now gone into her business and she can't forget it, which is 
wonderful. And I think that's what you're saying here is that when you, when you, when it's not a theoretical thing where it's a practical, physical embodiment of pressure, your cells remember it in the way that you, if, if you choose to remember it, the way you want to remember it so that it becomes impacts and infects in a positive way, everything that you do. That's what I took from her talk. I mean, that's what had happened for her. I mean, it doesn't hurt from everybody, but mm. but but that is our choice if we if we if we want to. Absolutely. The mind believes what the body feels. Yeah. If you are building strength and endurance and challenging yourself, your body will your mind grows in confidence and self-belief because you like you've just said, you're it's embodied cognition. So as a as as an individual, I believe we're all leaders in our own lives. You have the chance to get through tough. It makes you stronger, and it yes. makes your team stronger when you do it together. Yes, so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I'm glad that her climbing mountains is now part of her business life because that analogy works for all of us. And whatever it is for you, you can bring that learning and experience. The best way to experience is experientially. You know, not by slides and by PowerPoints, by by getting out and doing. We know as, mm. as, you, as a teacher, we know as people, mm. practical experience, going through experience, experiential learning is the strongest way for any of us to learn about ourselves and learn about others, learn about mm. others under pressure. Mm -hmm. Best way to find out how your team is and bond your team is get them together physically and doing something together. Yeah. Learn how yeah. you are under pressure. You learn about each other. You have wonderful oxytocin between you because you're close. That builds trust. There's so yeah. much magic that happens when people move purposely with intent and challenging together and individually. Yeah. You know, as Lara was talking there, I was reminded of the tome of a book entitled The Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance. Hundreds of scientists contributed to this research that looks into what it takes to become an expert performer. Here's one paragraph just to give you the feel of it. The journey to truly superior performance is neither for the faint of heart nor for the impatient. The development of genuine expertise requires struggle, sacrifice and honest, often painful self-assessment. There are no shortcuts. <laughs> now, I know that doesn't sound exactly like a bag of laughs, but what I like about it is that it pulls no punches. It reminds us of the effort and the consistency required to get better at something. And I think that's the key point that Laura's making here. We need to make it work for us. What does the daily effort look like for you, for example? She's found an invaluable link between signing up for a physical challenge and growing her overall confidence. She's turned an outdated self-talk of, I'm not good enough, into something more energizing, which for her is get better. Now for you, it might be something completely different, but what matters is the consistency, a little bit every day, or as Adia Depiton says, one extra shot every day. And he certainly wasn't talking about coffee. So I have to ask you this, Laura, when's been the, when, what's been the worst pressure you've ever been under? I, my husband says it's the pressure I put on myself. I think there's been two scenarios. One, when my son was incredibly and gravely ill. As a parent, of course, you want to fix it for them and I couldn't fix it. So I had no control. And seeing someone that you love in pain and not having a solution mm. was desperate for me because I couldn't do anything to help him. Mm. The other greatest pressure has been when I've been, my life's been in danger. So for example, we were on the Matterhorn, climbing the Matterhorn in the summer of 2014 when we shouldn't have been on the mountain. The Swiss guide said, don't go on. No one else had gone on. A third of the mountain was still under snow. Uh, it's metamorphic rock, which means as soon as the water falls, it starts to crumble away. And I had left two, two young children at home. So in some ways, you know, it was selfish and it was dangerous, but also it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life because I was Lara. I wasn't mother or wife or worker. I, I was me. It was an amazing challenge. However, the pressure was that we had to go and we had to try and summit and that with every step, I could have slipped and fallen. We weren't... Uh, 
hooked on. There were no hooks to the mountain. I had a rope to my guide for some of it, um, but it was dangerous. And that's where I learned that under great pressure, which I'd say turns into threat state, mm -hmm. when my amygdala has flooded your prefrontal cortex and you really can't think and function, is that I shut down. So I go quiet, I stonewall, and I am just coping. And I think that silence went on for about 16 hours as we got to about 4,000 meters. I'd slipped several times. I had crampons. There were rocks hitting my head. I knew I wasn't hooked on, as I've told you. And when you look back, I don't know if you've oh. ever in the Matterhorn is like, I've never seen anything like it. And it was pure, utter survival, Sarah. My Italian guide of, didn't seem to care a hoot. He was stopping and rolling joints on the way up. Blimey. I think he'd already made the decision that this woman probably wasn't capable of summiting. And so he was going slow. He wasn't filling me with confidence at all. And I was literally in survival mode. Was it just you and him? We, there was 10 of us on the mountain, but each of us with a different guide. Everyone had gone different routes. I didn't know where everybody else was. I had no, I had had one mountain climbing experience with crampons and an ice pick and a hat and all the rest of it. I'd only had one experience before this and we tried to scale the Matterhorn. Was it a purpose beyond self-interest that took them? I mean, if you'd been advised not to do it, what was it that allowed the team to make the decision to go and whose decision was it? Yes, that was, I mean, that was part of the Strive Challenge and we had, you know, millions of pounds being raised for right. children who strive in life in the UK. Um, it was part of the Virgin Strive Challenge. We were doing it for children who strive in life. Our aim was to summit the Matterhorn or the people running it had taken the decision that they would see us on there. We did have one of the lead guys was the best mountain climber in the world. Uh, wasn't my wasn't my guide. He he was with Sam Branson, but we did have people with us and in charge of this that knew mountains. Right. For me personally, as a mother of two young children, that was just I, I just needed to get down. I kept looking at him saying, I just need to survive. I need to, I need to go down. I need to get home, please. Yeah. I actually don't mind if I don't summit. I said that to him. If it becomes too dangerous, we turn around. There's nothing more important than getting back to my children. Wow, that does sound high pressure. What's interesting about those examples, I mean, life and death example, because it could have gone either way, hey, is understanding what you do. And I presume yes. it becomes a measure for you in terms of um, judging other pressures that have since happened in relation. It gives you a massive sense of perspective, I'm sure. Yes, it absolutely does. And you're quite right. It does give you a measure so that I know now um, the other time as well was when we were on the Zambezi and we got charged by hippos and I was close, close to being mauled then, um, complete shutdown is when I am under enormous threat state. Yeah. And yeah. I know that's the greatest pressure. That's how I respond. So then you have a parameter or barometer of your ability or a bandwidth. Yeah. 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 When you know, when pressure is so, you know, I use the word challenge when challenge becomes you stress or good stress. And it's yeah. opportunity or where challenges distress yeah. and, and it shuts you down. Yeah. So what that has given me in my older years is, is, is a, in, in maturity is an ability to know when it's too much and feels too much. And what are the signs? What, what are the first signs when you feel like it's heading towards too much? I have a physical reaction where I can feel my heart rate, but my body is shaking and tingling, but is, feels frozen and I feel choked. So I like, really know that that's high threat state is a physical thing first. And then I start to understand, obviously I know more about the brain now, so I try and process what's yeah. going on, but it is a physical reaction first. Yeah. I mean, I think it always is, isn't it? It's that chain, isn't it? Physical yes. first, then an interpretation by your, um, your emotional hub of your brain. And then, um, something normally in action before the uh, human cortex has got even involved in the decision making. And sometimes that's very helpful, right? I mean, in a way, shutting your prefrontal cortex when you're at the, on the top of the matter, when, you, when you're at a peak like that, it's probably very helpful because actually it could only get in the way. It's very clever, isn't it, in a way, the body? It's so interesting because I was talking to someone only last week who says that they shut down in a meeting when a particular person talks <laughs> because they feel 
uh, belittled and they feel unnecessary mm. in the meeting was the word actually that they used unnecessary component of the meeting that's how i feel in relation to this person when they're speaking and when i asked them what happens she said something very similar right shut down pull the shutters down go very very quiet mm -hmm. so in a way it's the same response but under less stress in a way. I mean, it's not a life or death situation, but of course the body doesn't understand the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, our brain is there to keep us safe, always scanning for threat. Um, yeah. And it's exactly the same response as you say, the body doesn't know. It feels the same as it's summiting the Matterhorn as to that person was feeling in the meeting. It's exactly the same for me. I do too. Shut down in a meeting or shut down when someone feels you, makes you feel less important and less valued when you feel out group and you don't feel, you know, they want you in, they're inviting you in and that you're part of the team and you're trusted. Yep. Fairness value when you don't see other people. Those three key drivers for me, when they're in threat state, same. I shut down and I've seen that in business. I've seen that with other leaders and in teams when that impacts me. Um, and of course, the learning physically helps that. But it yes. absolutely does happen. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because what I'm what I'm intrigued about is because you've had that extreme Mm. more than once actually extreme version of your body shutting down but actually carrying on and helping you survive you prove to yourself that actually your body yes. can take you can, can actually deal with something as high pressure life and death situation as that so when you know that when you've got that sort of range it's what i you know you we're trying i think in pressure to increase people's range and capacity yes and when you have that range then those moments might feel, or your body's interpreting it like that, but you do have that immediate sense of perspective, don't you? To say, actually, I'm not going to die here. Uh, this is one human being and it's my choice how I respond to him or her. Yes. And it is uncomfortable and I do feel this way and I'm labeling my feelings, which helps, but I also yeah. believe I can get through. I've done yeah. this. I've got through it before. I'm only as good as my training and my learning. Yes. Yes. I can, I can now apply it. But yep. it's that confidence, that self-belief, you know, confidere with trust. I trust that I can. It's difficult right now. I feel shut down. I feel belittled. I am in stress, right? I'm feeling it. I hear it. I know I can get through. That's what, yep. that's what helps. That's what helps. Yep. That's that I can manage it. Yep. Not suspecting at all that it's very difficult in the moment. Um, Agreed. And I think what's what's interesting about those two examples that you shared, one about your son, where you, you I think the phrase is you didn't feel like you had any control and how how igniting that is yes. to a feeling of of pressure is yes. when I mean, we all want to keep control. We all want to try and have some agency in the choices that we make. And with something like that, it felt almost worse than the 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 other example when you're yes. under physical, because at least then you can choose to put one foot in yes. front of the other at the pace you want. And you can choose, you can see where you're going and what's in your control. Well, as much as what's in control yes. versus yes. the weather. But with your son's example, and when, you know, when we've got people that we care about and love and they're unwell and they could be seriously unwell, that's a whole other pressure, isn't it? Which requires... Oh potentially a different practice. I don't know. What's your view on that? It's a different pressure because I felt helpless in a way. Yeah. So when, when I know in a business situation or a physical situation, I've got through it before. I can rely on myself. I'm actually okay. I'm not yeah. going to die. Well, I'm not going to die. I'm not unwell and ill. And I, I still have the resources compared to when we were looking at Austin's situation and we didn't have a pathway through and there wasn't an answer. Mm. And is that the first time in my life I felt helpless, unable to help? Probably. And that's mm. why it was the greatest pressure. What mm. do you have in my toolkit, Laura? I've been able to rely on something somewhere since I was a child, but there, it wasn't there. Mm. So I do think it's different, Sarah, but I don't know what, I mean, that's when trusted others come in. That's when this incredible yeah. Asian female doctor, I would say saved our lives and I'll be grateful to her forever. So that is yeah. when a trusted other with knowledge and expertise comes into the fore uh, and helps you. But I guess, you know, my dad said I came out fiercely independent, 
did everything myself, didn't rely on everyone. So there's yes. that person in me mm-hmm. that wanted to be able to have something in the toolkit yeah. and always relied on that. But in that situation, I, I, I didn't. So, so what did you, I mean, obviously you found someone, thankfully, that could um, help. But, but what would be your, I, I suppose, you know, one of the phrases we use is having a pressure practice, you know, something that actually yes. in, aids the pressure in situations and the situations are different. And those two situations were very different. What would mm. you say helped you mm. other than the doctor arriving? Fantastic. D- mm. Did you have any other learning about mm. yourself in that sort of less controllable situation? Yeah, so I suppose that's a really good question because actually I didn't draw the analogy because I wasn't totally helpless because what I did have was the ability to ask others, the ability, right. to, you know, to, the ability to ask for support yes. and not try to do it myself. So yes. that, that was a good learning that no one is a self-made man, self-made woman that trusted others, a team, asking for support, being vulnerable, telling people how you feel. So the huge learning in that with Austin and in life, uh, for me. Um, sorry, what was your other question? <laughs> no, that just, 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 you know, um, having had that experience, what did you call on? And I oh, suppose yeah. what I'm hearing there is you called on your ability to ask for help, which is not a muscle that you use very often. That's the um, one. and, and was there anything else that you called on or you realized the power of that you hadn't potentially, um, realized before and that you can potentially call on in mm. a similar example that's not necessarily physically pressurizing yes thank you and that's a really good example i've been talking about emotional things and that had clouded my prefrontal cortex when i was trying to ask your question so that's just mm. to say, just to say to people right it happens yeah. uh, <laughs> and it's normal um i think I've learned to rely on, I like to put it into the three P's now, Sarah, which I find useful in all all life is pause, process and proceed. And that Mm -hmm. pause might be my exercise. That pause might be going to talk to someone else. That pause is just to allow yourself some time to Mm -hmm. let the mind calm, to let that emotional response and the electrical activity come out of there, down into alpha wave and then to process What's going on here? Why am I feeling like this? Ask the powerful questions of yourself and of others if you need feedback. Sarah, what are you seeing? I'm behaving and feeling like this. Mm. Experience like that. How can you help? And that again, it, with, with Austin was the pause, what's going on here? The processing was, I need help. I need to talk to someone. Yeah. And then you can move forward. So finding yeah. your ways of using those three Ps and finding the ways to find that pause to allow yourself to process and then to move forward with knowledge and proceed. Great, thank you. This need we have for control is a biological imperative. And one way to prove to ourselves that we are in control is by making a decision. Each choice, no matter how small, reinforces the perception of control and reminds us that we can actually take charge of ourselves. Lara's three Ps give her a useful personal framework for remaining in control of her choices. I really like this. And what's interesting is that when she was worried about her own life up the Matterhorn, and when she was deeply worried about her son's life, the practice of the three Ps served her and helped her find what she could control. Up the mountain, she could control her fear by shutting down and going deeply internally focused. And with her son, she leant out and asked for help building around her the support she and her family needed. Now, I'm the first to admit how difficult I find it to ask for help in high pressure moments. In fact, I can exacerbate the pressure by telling myself, I can handle this, Sarah, and totally bypassing the pause and process parts and instead jump straight into, right, proceed. I witness others doing exactly the same thing in organizations creating pressure for themselves and for others by failing to ask for help or failing to delegate because they fear this loss of control. These are mostly instinct choices, not considered ones. When we have ways to slow down and recognize what's happening, we open our options and choices for controlling what's possible to control. And remember, we can always control ourselves if we choose to. I'm reflecting on something that you said to me, actually, when we were talking before, um, 
which I've never forgotten, is that uh, you had, um, when you were talking about building a habit, I mean, it's in a way like how you can repeat some of those lessons is, um, and you said uh, recency, frequency equals fluency. I've never forgotten that, Laura. I thought that's such a great way of thinking about using whatever um, new knowledge, new mm -hmm. insight, into something that actually then becomes useful for the rest of your life. But if we don't use it as soon after the event, we lose it. It's like, you know, some number of times I read books, I think, oh, that's such a great point. Write it yeah. down. Um, and then like a month later, I'm thinking, what was that point? Um, yeah. You know, because I haven't actually repeated it to myself, written it, used it, said it out loud, taught someone else, you know, anything. And yeah. we sometimes just over promise, don't we? Uh, with so much input. So um, I really, I really like that idea of um, recency, mm. frequency equals fluency. Fluency, yeah, absolutely. The, the neurons that fire together, wire together. 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 Um, lo lots of things in there again, and that's why I love this conversation. Three things, the brain loves things in threes. Much easier to remember. The, the trickle on, Obama used loads in all of his speeches. Um, but yeah. the recency plus frequency equals fluency, you know, that helps us wire in information so that that neural pathway ingrains. Yes. And you become fluent in that way of thinking. But it takes time. And I think that's the hard bit right now is that we want things fast and fun and accessible and right now, and there's so much going on. Yeah. Our working memory can hold, what, two, three, four pieces of information, but we're flooded every day with, oh, want to do this, oh, want to buy this, all these windows open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no wonder we, we feel flooded. Yeah. Uh, and it's 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 almost too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we stick with threes, three things we want to do, three things we want to remember. Yes. Become fluent in them, if, especially if they're important. Three yeah. things you want to practice and, and regularly use. Uh, use that power of three. I think it's yeah. highly useful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that segues really beautifully and um, into my uh, usual question, which is, if there were two things, Laura that you would pay forward from mm -hmm. the whole of your experience, living and breathing pressure, what would those two things be? I would invite everyone to use the magnificence, whatever talent and ability, unjudging your body well. Challenge your physical muscle in a way that gives you fun and community and purpose but use it. A muscle left atrophies. It weakens and dies. A muscle challenge grows and strengthens. Yes, it can have rest and recovery in there, but please, please, please. It is a gift of nature. And I say it again, irrespective of your talent and ability, it doesn't matter. You have to be good at something. Mm. Just do something that challenges your body. And I, and I have been challenged on that because people talk about, I have friends that are wheelchair users. I have friends with cerebral palsy. It's relative to the individual. I, I mentioned hand and foot mouth painting. They're all different ways that which we yeah. can challenge ourselves physically and experientially learn that yes, I can, and it can happen. And with that challenge, will come more confidence, more self-belief, whatever our age, whatever our talent and ability. The other thing I would pay forward would be, I think those, those three Ps, knowing how the brain works, mm. seek to understand, you know that wonderful thing, seek first to understand and then be understood. Seek mm. to understand why your brain does it, why you feel the way you do, why your brain responds the way it does, why your body does. There's information available everywhere for free on a Google search. Mm or through Sarah Milne Rowe and some of her wonderful animations and methods yeah. and, your, and, and your book. But there, there are ways. And I speak to a lot of people, especially a lot of women who are lacking in confidence and worry. Please tell me how, please tell me how. I want you to lead in your own life. Find out how. Mm. It's there. And it's not hard and it's one step. Yeah. So maybe it's be a challenge seeker. And one step at a time. Great. Thank you, Laura, so much. <laughs> You're powerful very conversation. Um, very great, great questions. I'll now go away going, oh, I wanted to tell Sarah this. And, oh, I wanted to tell Sarah that. And, <laughs> oh, what about this? <laughs> yeah, but you let it go. You let it go when the, uh, the starting gun went. <laughs> exactly. 
And we had a conversation, which is the most important part. It's not a lecture. So true. That is so true. And I think the more we realize that, actually, that it's a conversation with ourselves, it's a development conversation that is always about improving and becoming better and take the pressure off, just increase it slightly each yes. time. Then yes. it becomes incredibly powerful and we surprise ourselves with our brilliance. Absolutely. Uh, oh, you know, and, and opportunity or threat, opportunity or threat, which, which is it? Which would I like to see it as? And choose it. And choose it. And you, and you really can, not in all circumstances. I understand that. I know some things in life are very, very difficult and I don't want to minimize anyone's trauma or, or difficulties, but our mind and our mindset is incredibly powerful and changing that neural pathway is possible. We know neuroplasticity exists. Yes. But like, anything, like anything, it's hard work. Absolutely. And that's why I have never agreed with the sentence that, well, they just can't change. Totally agree. Totally agree. You absolutely can. Nothing good comes from easy. Soft shoes, easy life, easy, nothing good. No. We need we need a bit of tough. Everyone knows that. It's on every podcast and 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 article and you know, get out of your comfort zone, do something tough because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Because things for a lot of people have become very easy and comfortable. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. It's been been wonderful to talk to you and really, really interesting. I'm now I'm now zipping away. <laughs> the lo the lovely lady you spoke to in your last podcast about her the pilot. Yes, oh, Marsha. I promise I'll stop talking in a minute. No, it's fine. Don't. Um, and the plane coming down and him going to his level of his training. Training. So I spoke to my dad, who was a pediatrician, one of the last people to do national service in the 1950s in the Yemen. Um, wow. He worked in the fever hospitals in London when children were dying all the time before they had MMRs, before they had measles, you know, mm. evacuations. And he actually had to do blood transfusions on babies with a tiny pipette. And he'd help take all the blood and, and transfuse baby. And I said to him, that's pressure, mm. life and death. But how did, how did you cope? And he, 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 well, I just did it. It was a job and I had to do, but I was trained. So he said, he uses the word shut down. I shut down the emotional response and I a training. did, yeah, exactly what the textbook said I had to do. Yeah. The level of my training, just like the pilot said, is what I was trained to do. We, we under pressure, we fall to the level of our training. I think it's so true. And um, that drilling, it's it's fascinating uh, jobs like your dad and and the, and Marsha's father and those life and death situations. You know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in the way that they are trained. They're yeah. trained so that they can. And it was the same when we spoke to Andy Salmon. You're trained to deal with life and death. And the drilling of that training is essential so that the emotional brain can shut down and you can get on with doing what you've, you know, you can do almost on autopilot that you can do it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what, what's the underlying lesson here, Sarah, for all of us is that the brain needs training. I'm afraid it's hard work. Yes. But your brain needs training and experience, and then you will be better under pressure. You will be better every day, but it's, it's training. I'm afraid. <laughs> so true so oh. true but more helpful if you can do your training with other like-minded people that makes it enjoyable hey which is totally community saying. purpose others fun yeah. with it you know the word training doesn't need to be let's use the word experience go and experience things you yeah. know you rise to the level of your experience if that's a better word for you choose something that's motivating but yes with others and with purpose fabulous Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better and turn it into a positive relationship. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method, or alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.